We're one of the, the leading countries in terms of the thermal use of Earth's energy heat energy. And in fact, Geothermal Canada was founded in 1974. So we've been around uh, more than 40 years. And uh, it, uh, it, it really is as the result of some of the early pioneers in geothermal who had attended a geothermal, uh, now called Geothermal Rising, but Geothermal Resources Council meeting in 1973 and, um, and thought, this was an important thing for Canada to do. Next slide. So the objectives is we really are about science and promotion of geothermal. So we're about trying to, to establish collaborative investigations. We're about networking. We're about trying to get out the technical side of the geothermal story. Next. And before I hop into to my presentation, which will give you some of the background, I do want people to, to know that, in fact, we did produce power here in Canada at Mount Meager. And uh, that was done in 19, 1984. So can, Canada has had geothermal power produced. We also, since 1989, have had the Spring Hill Mine um, uh, project, which is using deep warm mine waters. And in fact, the University of Regina in 1978-79 also drilled a geothermal well. Unfortunately, that it was to heat part of the campus and it um, that project wasn't completed. But just to give you an idea that uh, we do have this kind of a background. So I think, uh, next slide. So here are the, the sessions that we're going to have. You can go onto the website. You can sign up each of these. We haven't figured out how to, to allow you to sign up for all of them at once. Um, unfortunately, you're gonna to have to sign up for each one individually. Next. Um, next. And this is going to be next week's presentation. So it's given by a Canadian company based in Ontario called Geosource. And they're gonna be looking at basically geo exchange. So today we're going to focus on what I'm gonna be calling conventional geothermal. But next week we're going to be shifting a little bit and giving you a little bit more background and context into geo exchange. So Phil, do you want to, while I get my um, presentation up, do you want to say anything to members about the, the codes and the, the member page? And um, Well, I think um, uh, we, we've sort of provided the promo code. I think there was a little bit of uh, a, a few hiccups in, in the registration process, but I think obviously everyone that's here got it sorted out. Um, so we'll, uh, when we post for the next course, we'll maybe make uh, instructions a little bit more explicit, but um, yeah, basically the promo code will come to you through the email. Um, it'll be the same promo code for all the upcoming course series. Um, for organizations, uh, there'll be, uh, you can have, you can forward that promo code to anybody within the organization. Um, we're taking a bit of an honor system there. Uh, you know, I think we're providing pretty good value with the course here. So um, that promo code can be kind of distributed within the organizations. And um, otherwise, uh, yeah, we're happy to have everyone here. Super. Thanks, Phil. All right, let's get rolling here. Put on my timer. I don't go over time. This is me. I think that um, really what, um, what I'd like people to, to know and understand is that I've been in the geothermal industry for 40 years now and um, have done kind of everything from greenfield exploration to resource management. And, and that's what gives me the perspective to, to in fact, um, you know, with myself and my colleagues is to present this course is between us, we've kind of been there and we've done most of it, if not all of it. But what I really want to in this, in this introduction is really talk about what geothermal is. And it is the elephant in the room. And having been in geothermal for the last 40 years, I can tell you it's cyclic. 
And that cyclicity has to do with the price of oil and gas. That is the major competition, at least for, well, that's a major competition for geothermal is oil and gas. When the price of oil and gas goes up, there is increased interest in geothermal. When the price of oil and gas goes down, not so much interest in geothermal. That changed basically about two years ago. And two years ago is when suddenly things like greenhouse gas reduction and uh, you know, greening of our environment became much more important. And we suddenly had a divergence of geothermal, of, sorry, we had a divergence of geothermal investment from the price of oil and gas. So it is this elephant in the room. I mean, those of you who are, have a geoscience background will know that the earth has a gradient, as we drill downward, um, it gets hotter, but unfortunately it's not hot or not as hot in all places in the, in the subsurface. These are the topics that we're going to, to cover and it really is kind of everything that, that we think is important to convey to, to those of you who are interested in geothermal. So we're going to be talking about commercial considerations. We're gonna be talking about, about um, you know, the technical side. So all, all of this is going to be presented to you between now and the beginning of April. And it will be, so all of the presentations will be on that members only page on, uh, on the Geothermal Canada website. So you'll be able to go back if you can't make one of these, you know, you can go back and you can listen to it. So again, I want to, to start off here by giving you the context. Why geothermal? Why have we seen this huge increase in, in interest in geothermal? And it really is because as we look and we talk about greening the world, in that process, what people have come to realize is that, yes, we can continue to build wind. We need to build wind. We can continue to build solar. And yes, we need to build solar. But what we really need is base load renewable. And geothermal is that. It, in fact, is base load. And I'll talk about a little bit about why that's important in, in a moment, but it is it's particularly important because it doesn't have this, this um, you know, like when the wind blows, that's why offshore wind is becoming much more prevalent now because the wind speeds are much more constant offshore than they are onshore. So you don't get the same kind of um, dips and, and increases in the, in the system. Um, but, you know, solar best if you're in an area with uh, high, high solar radiation. And uh, for us up here in Canada, our winters are not so, so good for solar radiation. So we need that baseload power. The, it has excellent environmental, societal, and governance values. So this ESGs. So if you're a company that is looking to, to get financing internationally, you will be able to get your financing much easier if you are able to show that your project has good ESG values. Geothermal gives you that. It's actually the best in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction. So it's the lowest. It has the dual commodity. And although you know, we tend to slip into the power mode, in fact, what we cannot fail to remember is that that thermal energy is equally important to the power energy. And then, of course, for jurisdictions like Canada that have a significant hydrocarbon um, industry already, it basically piggybacks off of that industry. So I just wanted to focus a little bit on, on this base load, because what is important for that is, in fact, we don't require battery storage. So a geothermal project, whether it is producing thermal energy for like district heating or whether it is producing electrical power, it doesn't need a backup. And that backup in today's um, environment is, is usually lithium. 
And one of the things, and we'll be talking more about this when we're talking about the commercialization aspects, is wind and solar look really cheap. Um, those projects can be delivered at a very low price per kilowatt hour. But what most of, of those projects, it's not that they necessarily fail to divulge, but they don't talk about is the backup storage capacity that is required for the grid. And that's typically because those projects, the grid is handled separately from in fact, the power generation. So that's why you don't see that um, mentioned. But when you, when you add a battery backup, then you actually get to the point where in fact, the price of, of the produced power is about the same for a solar or wind project as it is for geothermal. And I've already talked about this multi-commodity value. What I wanted to emphasize here is that, as I said at the beginning, in this course, we're going to be covering the full gamut. We're going to be covering everything from, from high temperature systems to the lowest temperature systems to geoexchange. And, uh, and next week's uh, presentation will be focused on geoexchange. And that's really just to help us understand the difference between the spectrum of, of energy um, utilization. If we're talking about deep geothermal, and we're we'll going to call it conventional geothermal, where we're bringing the brine to the surface, that brine has other commodities which are associated with it, not just the heat and not, uh, and not just for power generation. So what I've shown here is what else you can do. So we have hydrocarbon separation. If there happens to be hydrocarbons associated with your, your brine, throw in the solar collector because it can help us with our parasitic load. If we can produce power, great. Um, heat exchange for direct use. Lots of talk about lithium and some of those geothermal brines in fact do have lithium. So if you're bringing that uh, brine to the surface, why not produce uh, essentially extract lithium? if it's commercially feasible. The big one though that we're working on right now is carbon sequestration. And that is using, uh, using the subsurface, using those injection wells that we have to build for, our, for carbon sequestration as well as injection of our, our brines. So you're gonna hear more about that later in other presentations. So this is the opportunity. We need to get to a carbon zero world. We need geothermal because it will help us get there. Carbon credits, cascading use of the brine, carbon sequestration. It allows the, the advent of new industry in some areas like growth of greenhouses, food security, um, industrial composting. Um, it allows us particularly with those green credits and the carbon sequestration to help um, eco-industrial clusters and help the hydrocarbon industry become greener. So just quickly touching here in the next, uh, in the next five minutes is what is geothermal? So again, we have the spectrum. We have everything from high temperature volcanic systems to shallow using ground as a battery geoexchange systems. What we're going to be focusing mostly on here is, is those conventional geothermal systems. What we need is we need pore space and permeability. We need fractures and we need a, a source of heat. We're going to simply um, use the existing reservoir in the subsurface, it might be limestones, dolomites, um, shales, sandstones, brecciated rock, tufts, depending on what your environment is. And we're gonna extract those brines, uh, uh, extract the brine, then usefully use the energy and then pump it back down into the subsurface. There are many kinds of geothermal systems. So this is simply a, a listing of them. In Canada, and, and you're going to hear more about this in a moment from Steve, is the, the sedimentary basins are kind of the big one, most extensive, but there are many kinds of geothermal systems. Some of these we have in Canada and some of the, them that we don't. 
One thing to understand is that the heat is not the same everywhere. It's about enthalpy. So enthalpy is the energy content of the brine. So what that means is how much work can we get out of that brine? High enthalpy systems means that we can produce electricity, but not necessarily out of the low enthalpy systems. So this little table just really gives you how people have classified that enthalpy. Um, and the, the bottom line is that Canada is down there in that, in that um, intermediate to low enthalpy systems. We have a few volcanic systems that we may be up into that high enthalpy system. But what is important here is that it doesn't actually matter whether your enthalpy is high or low. What matters is at the low enthalpy end, you have to move more brine. You have to bring more of that brine to the surface because you will have to extract a greater amount of heat from it. So the lower the enthalpy, the, the more mass flow that is required. Um, this, this slide is really about what you can, what you can do. Um, those, it, what is important in these lower enthalpy systems is that um, typically power is generated using a binary cycle. And again, we're going to get more into that in other lectures. But um, in fact, there are different ways to extract that energy depending on what the temperature is. And I'm just going to, hopefully this will play. So one of the, the projects that is currently um, um, underway in Canada is, is the Deep Earth Energy Systems, uh, Deep Earth Energy Project, which is in the southernmost part of Saskatchewan. And this is just a, a, a neat little video that they have put together that will give you an idea of, uh, you know, kind of what this, what this kind of might look like at the early exploration stage. So let's hope that this works. I'm going to stop the video and I'll just encourage you to, uh, to basically go to the Deep Energy site and see this video. So Emily, does that, that will work. Yep, anyway, that works. Thank apologies, you. apologies about that. I didn't realize that. So, okay, let's, there we go. Okay, so moving on here is this is our little schematic. We're bringing that hard energy up to the surface. We're, th we're moving it through some kind of an electrical generating plant as long as the temperatures are high enough or heat exchanger and that from the heat exchanger, it's going to a, a district system. And then I think, whoops. And now this is, so, so here's what I spoke about earlier, just with these peaks and valleys in terms of the investment in geothermal. So now we're at the present where the value that is being um, valued here is the greenhouse gas reduction. So Steve, I'm going to um, hand it over to you. So Steve is a research scientist with the Geological Survey of Canada, my old alma mater too. <laughs> and uh, he's been working on geothermal in Canada for the last few decades. So he's gonna give us an overview of, of the potential in Canada. So hey, over thanks. to you, Steve. Thanks, Kathy. I'll just... Uh to share my screen here so people can just bear with me for a moment. Do you see the presentation screen or the, the slide sorter one? Presentation, you're good to go. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm just uh, going to do this quick overview then of what we know of the geothermal uh, potential of Canada. This is something that uh, the Geological Survey of Canada first started in the early 70s um, when there was a formal geothermal energy program. It ran for a decade. It ended in 1985 with the end of the um, energy crises. 
and um, and I've kind of revived the the work um, for the last twenty years or so, and we've been trying to you know use largely the data and information that was collected during that program and pull it together to put a picture of what the geothermal potential of Canada is. So just to put some context of what we're looking for when we try to understand the potential is you have to you know come up with a model of where the resource would be. Um, you can think of many parallels to uh, oil and gas uh, uh, play analysis. So first of all, you need a source of, of heat and in earth, this is almost a, a greatly comes from the radioactive decay of uranium, thorium, potassium, these three elements in the crust. So most of the heat in the earth that's radiating to the surface is generated in the crust, uh, not the core. And uh, so that's 83% of the heat is crustal generated and, and then mantle cooling is uh, from formation of the earth at the last four and a half billion years is the rest. So you can see already that if those three elements are responsible for the vast majority of heat generation, that uh, variability of concentration of those elements becomes important and where you have more of that radioactive decay generating heat, you're gonna have uh, a greater potential for geothermal resources. Also, you have to think of a trap, just like you have a petroleum trap. It's a little different now. This is a thermal blanket trap. You can do this experiment at home if you want uh, tonight, but we all know this, right? Because our bodies generate heat, um, but we all get very cold if we're lying there with nothing on top of us at, in bed at night. So we put a blanket on and that traps the heat that our bodies generate. So the blanket itself isn't warm, but it's capturing the heat that we generate. And, um, and that is what keeps us warm at night. You can prove this by sticking your feet out the end of the blankets and you can see how cold they are in, in the middle of the night. So it's very similar from a geothermal point of view. Um, it's those basement rocks, the, you know, uh, the metamorphic igneous rocks that have higher uranium, thorium, potassium content that are generating heat. So like the, the basement underneath the sedimentary basins of Canada. And although that's generating the heat, where that basement is exposed, like the Canadian Shield, it's very cold because all that heat is just radiating out uh, into space. But where we have sedimentary rocks that have low thermal conductivity over top of that basement, they act as a thermal blanket and they trap the heat that is being produced from the underlying rocks. So, so in this case, sedimentary basins can be attractive uh, geothermal uh, plays, but it's not because they generate heat, it's because they're trapping the heat that's generated underneath them. And depth, of course, is a big constraint, right? Because drilling is, costs money. And you can just see this diagram on the left, just illustrating the simple concept that geothermal gradients are typically linear with depth. So the temperature increases at a, a regular rate as you go deeper, but drilling costs increases exponentially. So it gets exponentially more difficult, expensive to reach a higher temperature. So although the higher temperatures are better because you have a more higher enthalpy systems as Kathy just talked about, the cost to get to, to that increases exponentially. So of course you wanna find the shallowest, hottest environments that you can. And another big constraint is permeability. And this plot on the right just shows that there's typically an exponential decrease in permeability with depth, just because rocks get weaker, the higher the uh, confining pressure they're under. So those pore spaces and pore necks that connect uh, pores just start to close up. So the deeper you go, the less permeable in general your rocks are gonna be. So another reason why you want to find a shallower, uh, higher temperature resource. And another issue is just fluid production, as Kathy just alluded to as well, for um, uh, the, the lower the enthalpy systems, the more fluid you need. And this is just a simple calculations that we did, just estimating cost of energy produced for different temperature fluids. So those colored lines represent temperatures, 150 degrees Celsius, 120, 80, 60, and it's plotted against flow rate. And it illustrates a couple of things. So one is that, if you have a low flow rock, low permeability rock, you can't get a lot of fluids out of it. There's a big um, diversity in the cost of producing energy. So much cheaper to produce energy from those high temperature fluids than the low temperature ones. But as your flow rate goes up, all those costs of production drop and they converge. 
So the horizontal bar represents about the average energy cost for electrical production. And you can just see uh, as your flow rate gets up, geothermal production gets very cost competitive, but also the, the range of price range of production, uh, it, it narrows a lot so that it could be, you could be producing at almost the same, um, you know, value of energy from a lower temperature resource if you can find a higher producing reservoir. So it's not just about finding that higher temperature, it's finding a high permeability productive zone that becomes very important. And then finally, when we start to look at where can we use, uh, find geothermal resources, it's about understanding how we want to use it, right? So for oil and gas, it's pretty uh, you know, common standard usages, but for geothermal, the nature of the resource dictates how you can use it. So uh, these, it, we can divide it into two, the top two is electrical generation and the bottom is more direct use. So if we have these very high temperature resources over 180 degrees Celsius, you can produce these hot waters from subsurface. It flashes the steam, that steam goes through a conventional turbine like you would have in a coal burning power plant or something of that nature. So very standard te technology it gets condensed and re-injected into the subsurface. If you have lower temperature fluids and, you know, just saying about 80 to 180 degrees Celsius here, um, some places you can get lower than 80, but uh, here it's too low to flash the waters you produce to surface to steam directly, but um, you can heat up another fluid. So you call this a binary system where you heat some kind of organic uh, compound and that that flashes to a vapor phase at a lower temperature than the, the water would. And then that would run a turbine. So you can still produce electricity from these lower temperature fluids, but it's at a much lower efficiency. So these systems are maybe like 10% efficiency. So that affects some of your cost structure. You can also, de really depending on, on, it doesn't matter what the temperature is, you can always use it for, for things like district heating or any kind of industrial heat use for geothermal, so it's just using it direct use for heating, so don't bother with the electrical step. And uh, as Kathy said, next week there'll be a, a discussions on heat exchange systems. We don't really consider this geothermal because it's more of using the shallow subsurface as a, as a thermal battery where you pump heat in in the summer and then you extract it in the winter and you're cycling it back and forth. So if we want to look at geothermal resources in Canada, we can set up an exploration model, right? So as we talked about, you need a heat source, a heat trap, you need fluid to produce that heat from the subsurface to your generator or your end usage. You need permeability and depth becomes important again, just because of that dollar cost of drilling wells. So where can we find geothermal potential in Canada? Well, an obvious place to look for hot place spots is volcanoes. And uh, it's not always really even recognized within Canada that, that we are a volcanic country. We're sitting on the Pacific Ring of Fire and we do have active volcanoes. Um, you know, there's fumaroles and, and steaming volcanoes down at Mount Meager in the Garibaldi belt in the bottom, bottom left of that diagram. But uh, this is uh, actually these, uh, all these volcanoes, this was put together originally by Kathy, just a map of all the volcanoes in Canada. So there's quite a few and they're clustered into these kind of five major volcanic belts. So certainly a, a, a good a high potential area to look for these high temperature resources. And people have, right? So as part of that um, GSC led program I mentioned before, it went from 1975 to 85, they drilled the Mount Meager research well in conjunction with BC Hydro. And uh, this was the first geothermal power production in Canada, just for a couple of months. It was never connected to the grid, but it showed it was possible. And they discovered, water, discovered waters that are 250 degrees Celsius, so very high temperatures. Um, just to date, they haven't had the permeability that they need to make this a success. But uh, fortunately, there's some very clever uh, drilling uh, companies from uh, Calgary that have purchased this uh, resource and then they're actively looking at developing it today. Another place you can start to look for high temperature areas are, are hot young rocks. So these are paleogene and younger intrusive uh, igneous rocks. So basically in the Cordillera of Western Canada from BC up until Yukon and, and parts of uh, Northwest Territories. These are the plutons that make this spectacular climbing country, you know, like the bugaboos and 
in circadian climbables and in, in, in those areas, uh, like in the photo there in the top right. And just why these become interesting is that because there are igneous rocks that are again high in those heat generating elements, uranium, thorium, potassium, have very high concentrations. They're young enough that it hasn't decayed over time. So they're generating a lot of heat. And what's really interesting is that at quite a number of the naturally occurring thermal springs in Canada, like this one you can see in the photo, occur right on the side of these plutons. So it shows that they're generating a lot of heat and they're generating active geothermal systems uh, right on the side of them. There is a, a well that was drilled in one, the Coriol cyanate uh, down in the bottom of uh, southeastern BC and, and indeed shows very high thermal gradients um, that was looked at as part of that same geothermal program. Sedimentary basins uh, are attractive, partly because they just underlie so much of Canada. Um, you know, almost half the country is underlain by sedimentary basins. So that's all the green on the map here. And we also have just an abundance of data uh, uh, from the petroleum industry that has drilled, you know, hundreds of thousands of wells across the country. Uh, this is just a histogram of the geothermal gradients that are recorded uh, from temperature measurements from petroleum wells. And you can just pick a temperature if you say like a gradient of 40 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So after three kilometers depth, you're getting up to 120 degrees Celsius. And these are getting pretty interesting numbers at not too deep of a, of a well depth, right? And you can see there's quite a few areas where there's just documented gradients of that, of that nature. And as Kathy mentioned too, I mean, this was another well that was drilled as part of the geothermal program in conjunction with the University of Regina, where uh, you know, they're looking to use direct heat uh, systems. So again, we have just this abundance of data uh, about uh, temperatures of uh, sedimentary basins. And this is just the focusing on the Western Canada sedimentary basin where we have the, you know, the highest known temperatures. And this map just shows the temperature at the bottom of the sedimentary basin or at the sediment basement contact. So if you look at that cross section, it's basically the, you know, the temperature gradient as you go along that, that bottom of the basin. So, so again, we'll go back to that. These sediments are trapping the heat being generated from the basement rocks underneath it. So the thicker the sediments, you know, the, the thicker the blanket, right? So the more heat can be trapped. And also as you go westward, it gets deeper and, and uh, just higher temperature because of the geothermal gradient increasing. So you can, you can talk about areas that are attractive for geothermal. Um, if we're looking at these kind of potential for higher temperature electrical generation, there's these areas around Western Alberta into Northeastern BC and uh, Southwestern Northwest Territories where you know, we're getting up into these 120 and higher Temperatures, uh, even you know, temperatures up to 200 degrees have been recorded in Northeast BC, where um, you're well within this range of, of electrical potential. As well as down in, in southern uh, Saskatchewan near Estevan, and that's where the deep project is with the, the video that, uh, that you had just seen, but unfortunately not heard. Um, we can just draw another line. This is sort of the 80 degree, 80 degree Celsius temperature line, showing again that there's um, you know, broader areas of the basin that are still getting pretty warm, right, for direct heat use and a lot of potential. And remember, again, uh, you know, I'm drawing these lines uh, on a 2D map, and that's the temperature at the bottom of the sediments, right, so at the bottom of that wedge that you see in the cross section, so that you still have all the sediment above it that gets cooler as you go higher, but then there's still a very, you know, still good potential um, throughout the column above it. As we get to the eastern part of the basin, it's getting pretty cool. You know, we're getting down to 20, 40, 50 degrees Celsius. So it's getting cooler, but there's still, you know, uh, clever ways you can use some of that thermal energy for different usages. A big key point on all of this, though, is that on that map, and it's a little hard to see, but all those dots are the communities that overlie the sedimentary basins in Canada. And and uh, electricity you can produce and put into the grid and, and move it around the continent. But heat, yeah, you only have, you can really use it uh, where it's produced. So you can't transport water very far uh, without your economics and heat loss and everything else just uh, killing the project. So what becomes very important in terms of looking at direct heat use is not where it's hottest, but what is the thermal potential 
of every specific need that there is. So you can look at a community and say, what is the potential of that community uh, for direct heat use based on the geology and the sediments and everything else? Um, so it's a different way of, of looking for the resource. You're not always looking for the, the best resource. You're looking for the resource where that's available where you need it. Um, and, and again, just looking at the sedimentary basins is this question of aquifers, right? So if you go back to that diagram on the bottom right, is that it's not always how hot it is, it's also how much fluid you can produce from that rock. And thanks again to the petroleum industry, we know a lot of information about this, right? So you don't necessarily need to drill a deep well to the deepest part of the basin to get the highest temperature of fluids. But if you can target, you know, these pinnacle reefs, you know, the Leduc reef systems, these very high porosity permeability uh, reefs that have been depleted from petroleum and now are just full of warm to hot water. Um, this is the project uh, being done in Fort Nelson, the Du d'Etat, uh, led by the Fort Nelson First Nation, <clears throat> where they're looking at the depleted uh, Clark Lake gas field as a geothermal reservoir now and targeting these old pinnacle reefs as the uh, warm water resource. And we mentioned heat exchange systems. So again, not really geothermal, but we'll still talk about it here because you can you know, just do some simple calculations of what is the energy potential from using the shallow systems as kind of a thermal battery through the year. And it's all about delta T. So that difference between ground temperature and air temperature. And then uh, you know, this is some modeling work that Yasek Majorowitz and myself did uh, a number of years ago, just to map across Canada what the heat exchange potential is. So it gets much better as you get into the colder regions of, of Canada and you know, lower potentials in the kind of the warm areas of Vancouver and, and Vancouver Island. We, uh, ex in this case, we excluded everything above the permafrost line just because it's much harder to do heat exchange in, uh, in permafrost settings. There's, uh, you know, the, the new frontier is uh, enhanced geothermal systems, but it's not that new. It's been talked about for a long time, but it just hasn't been uh, figured out how to make it really work yet. But uh, the U.S. Department of Energy has a big project on this, the Forge project, and trying to figure out how you can basically create a geothermal reservoir where there isn't one. So using uh, fracking technology and uh, deeper rocks that are too tight to produce a lot of fluid out, but if you can induce a uh, fractured network that you can then inject cold water that blew well in the middle and then produce the hot water after it goes through the rock on the on either side and then this removes this this necessity to find this you know porous permeable reservoirs and it opens up a lot of area for geothermal potential so it's a it's a very attractive uh, idea if it can be shown to work effectively so you know again we can map out the energy potential across the country where we have data. So this uh, map is one that we produce as well, showing the EGS potential in Canada. And we always like to point out that we only have about 40% of Canadian land mass. We have sufficient data to make such estimates. And that's with extrapolating no more than 50 kilometers from any one data point, which is still a bit of a extrapolation. So um, there's a lot of white in Canada, so we, we still are lacking a lot of fundamental information on geothermal potential. But with what we have, we can show there's certainly areas that are much hotter than, than others and, and much higher heat generation. And you know, if we just take a depth slice, we did here three and a half kilometers and you end up with this 3.8 times 10 to 11th gigawatt hour potential for EGS. It's just massive. It's, so it's over a million times Canada's energy needs. Um, you'll never produce all of that, right? It's so dispersed, but it's such a big number that even a small percentage of that gets very attractive uh, uh, resource potential. Uh, abandoned mines is another thing we can look at, and this has been the most successful geothermal project in Canada, the Spring Hill mine site where they're using abandoned coal mines to uh, produce just cool waters. It's like 15 degrees or so, something. But the volumes are so high. So again, it's you know volume can be more important than temperature, and you can produce so much water from a mine tunnel. It's almost infinite permeability, and then run it through a heat exchanger, and it's providing heating uh, for for industrial buildings and the town hockey rink and other things. 
and it's a great story, right? Because the, the town was built over the coal mine, the coal mine shut down, everyone lost their jobs. And then 40 years ago, they got very creative. They set up the system and were able to, to attract new industry to the towns on the promise of free heating for the warehouses, a plastics manufacturing plant, and they hired 10% of the population. So in a city like Calgary, that's like over 100,000 people getting a job because of someone's uh, right idea, right? It's, a, it's an astounding impact for that community. So we've been looking at other possibilities. We have a project going on right now looking at the Con Mine and, and Yellowknife. Um, can that be used to create a district heating system or attract some new industry to a, kind of a northern town with a cheap or a very low cost heating? And we can put this all together, then what is the geothermal potential of Canada? And, and this was really first done because back in you know, 2010 when this map was made is that lots of people had just said there was none. And, uh, and we would counter that there's tremendous potential. Uh, it varies where you are. That light gray part is the Canadian shield where there's that cold exposed um, basement rocks, so like the feet sticking out the end of the sedimentary basin of the bed. The, you know, there's, they're cold, they're generating heat, but there's low temperature. Maybe in the future, some EGS potential or something, we could look at developing that. But right now, it's kind of low priority. <clears throat> there's lots of warm sedimentary basins across the country that can be used for anything from district heating to, you know, small scale heat production, like in Spring Hill. Um, there's this warmer, hotter sedimentary basins where we can start to look at the electrical potential and some very hot sedimentary systems. And all the volcanic belts of Western Canada and the fracture systems and the and the um, various uh, young uh, plutons that have heat generation potential. So we've put all this together in a couple of reports. There's this one from Geothermal Energy Potential of Canada and, and a specific one on uh, geothermal potential for northern communities. So feel free to download those. They're they're uh, available for, for free at those uh, websites and you can easily track them down. And that's it. Super. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. I think uh, that gave everybody a pretty good overview of geothermal in general and uh, what, uh, what in fact we have here, the potential in Canada. And uh, yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, some of those hotspots uh, because of course my first love are volcanoes and volcanic systems. <laughs> <laughs> so I have been answering questions from the um, in the box, and um, there are there are were eight questions, and I've sorry I've just opened this up again. So I'm going to um, I'm just going to kind of run through them because I think they were they were um, um, very good questions. So if you look in the question the Q and A answered uh, box, you'll you'll see my responses to them. What I'd like to, uh, I believe you can unmute yourself. So if anybody wants to, to ask a question, the uh, please, uh, this is the time to, to do it. One of the questions, Steve, that I'd like to kind of direct to you is that- Sorry, Kathy, just one second. Um, if you want me to unmute you, I'll have to do it. Um, raise your hand and I will unmute you. Great. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, so that's that's Emily, who's helped us tremendously in the background to put uh, that's the voice <laughs> um, helped us tremendously to to put all of this together in uh, in short order, and she'll be kind of the main contact as we go through. So um, yeah, so if you'd like to answer a question verbally, please uh, raise your hand and Emily will open the mic. Um, so, so Steve, a couple of the questions that I'm, I'm just gonna go through them is, one of them is um, from Case, um, and he's, he asks, as part of the energy paradigm shift, do you believe geothermal can play an important role to accelerate decarbonization? And do you think big oil and gas companies will greatly support the transition? So sure. I've, I've written an answer. I'd like to know what you think. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. And, um, you know, if you look at it right now, like 80% of Canada's energy use, and this is probably typical for most um, developing developed nations, is that 80% of our energy is from petroleum or hydrocarbons, right? So 
it's a massive task to <clears throat> reduce 80% of our energy or transition to something else. I don't think geothermal can do it all, but I think we need a whole spectrum of, of renewables to, to if it's going to be achievable. And um, But geothermal is a very important part of that spectrum, and it has a very strong advantages compared to other renewables, as Kathy mentioned before, right? It's a stable base load power, and it provides heat as well as electricity. So <clears throat> it's a really important thing. And in Canada, for various reasons, it's been neglected. In, in terms of the petroleum industry side of things, uh, it's, I mean, a good thing to note until recently, Chevron uh, was the world's largest producer of geothermal energy until they sold off a, a project. So the oil industry has been involved. And uh, if you look at the projects now in Canada that are on the sedimentary basins, they're you know, based off of uh, all the knowledge and data we've garnered from the petroleum industry, but also their expertise at drilling wells and you know, I was about I don't know five six years ago in Iceland, and there, there was talking about this big exciting news that they drilled their first uh, horizontal geothermal well. And you know, we've drilled twenty thousand or more in Canada, right? So it's so what's you know new in the geothermal world is just routine in the petroleum industry, right? So it's just this tremendous knowledge and data and experience that that uh, is available. And I think if anyone can really make geothermal work, it's going to be Canadians, because we have that technology of, of its long history of, of uh, petroleum drilling that are you know, is completely applicable to this challenge. So, and, and it's, I think I see it happening, right? There's a, the, the people who bought the uh, Mount Meager geothermal project as a petroleum uh, driller from Calgary that, you know, now they're investing in renewables, right? So it's, it's happening. Yes, I, I agree. And, and I, I, one of the reasons why I started off with the fact that Geothermal Canada has been around since 1974. <laughs> it's just, you know, even though we don't have thousands of megawatts, we're not up there with Turkey. We're not up there who have made tremendous advances in the last, uh, the last decade in their geothermal, um, uh, you know, pursuit. We should be, and we can be. And it really is about getting the information getting the information out there and overcoming the initial capital hurdles. So somebody has asked uh, Alex, um, yes, he's interested in obtaining a certificate of the course. We'll, we'll definitely be working on that. And uh, uh, absolutely, we'll be sending out for, for all of you that register um, and attend, we will be sending out certificates. So stay tuned, that will come. The, the other thing that I think is important, and Steve, I like your opinion on that, and that is, so in the Canadian landmass, we have, we have the Western Canada Sedimentary Basin, which is our, our low to maybe moderate um, enthalpy system, but we have a huge amount of Canadian shield. And you spoke about this. I mean, to, to me that, geothermal advancement in terms of, of making a big impact is in EGS, is investing in EGS. And that's going to take money. It's going to take um, government and institutional um, work. But um, what's, what's your comment on that? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's uh, the, the huge advantage of the EGS system is that it removes this risk of finding permeable rock, right? And that's, um, if we go back to the Mount Meager example, I mean, they found 250 degree water there a, a few decades ago. <clears throat> but as then since then, they've been trying to find the, the permeable zone to get that out, right? So this is what's limited the development of what's the highest temperature resource we know. So if we can get around that challenge by EGS, it makes uh, the dramatically drops the risk. Um, I would I would only suggest that if we look at the shield, uh, it's one very low thermal gradients, meaning you have to drill deeper to even do an EGS system, <clears throat> and two very few Canadians live on the shield, so there's you know very few communities. <clears throat> so where it would be probably more interesting to look at something like EGS is a like drilling through the sedimentary basins, because then that heat is, it's the same rock, right? Generating heat, but now it's being trapped. So you don't have to go as deep to get mm -hmm. to the hot um, rock that you would do a 
EGS system. And you'd be drilling through relatively softer sediments to start with until you get into the harder granites underneath. So you could, you know, do a sub sedimentary basin EGS, which would be an interesting approach to take, but certainly well worth the the research uh, investment, I think. And, you know, you can go back to the uh, oil sands. That, you know, we knew that resource was there since 1800s when you know, McConnell first kind of canoed down the river and made note of all this oil saturated sands, but it was 150 years of investment and research that finally came up with a method that you could economically extract the oil from the sands. And, you know, whether people argue if that was a good idea or not, but I mean, it brought billions of dollars of investment into Canada. Um, so in the same way that we know there's this tremendous energy locked up in these deep rocks, but uh, we have to figure out how to get it out. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, Emily says there's two people. Uh, we have some more questions coming into the Q&A box. And, and I guess two people have raised their hand. Emily, do you want to get those people to ask us their questions? Yeah, the first question was from uh, William Landenberg, Langdenberg. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, maybe it's unfair to, to ask that question because you haven't <laughs> read that uh, long report yet, but uh, I just got it yesterday. And so I read over it and it just, I mean, this is the International Energy Agency and, and Sustainable Energy. And I was just, I just searched the report where they talk about geothermal and it was I was just amazed they're listing the different countries and like the Netherlands and Germany there's even nothing mentioned on geothermal and so I, I know it's it, it's as you know it's your efforts here in Alberta uh, politics have such a role in there and and how do, well, it's, I, I know from my colleagues in the Netherlands, how it, it's a struggle there too. They're, they're doing lots. They're using geothermal to do heat greenhouses and there's a big project in The Hague to do district heating, but uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's held up also by regulation there because there's oil come well, you know, the whole issue of the uh, regulation. It's a real challenge here in Alberta because Oil companies are still nervous to, to give up their, their mineral rights to geothermal energy. So, no, th thanks, Willem. Um, so the report that he is talking talking about, um, Willem, I will try to um, put that on the, uh, Emily, maybe you can see it. He put it in his Q&A. If you could just put that into the, the general um, uh, chat that would be great. What we're going to do with all of the, 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 the Q's and A's, so the Q's and A's, and the reason that's good to put it in the Q&A box is that um, those ones will be generated as a Word document. So you'll be able to see what, um, you know, what our responses were and uh, what the questions were. So um, anyway, watch for that when you go back to look at the at the the presentation. In addition, we'll be putting in links to to various um, reports, like what Steve had talked to. There was one question I've just had about um, uh, well, two of them. One about um, what universities provide courses in geothermal. We'll provide you with a list of those. And, um, uh, and then there's one question here from Wanju that I will leave till the end. Emily, do you wanna to go to the other question? Thanks, thanks, Willem. Willem is a strong supporter of geothermal. <laughs> we appreciate it. So the other question is from Alex Tardasella and you should be able to speak. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Steve, can you hear me? We yes. can, hi, Alex. Okay. Hi. Catherine, I know I posed this question before, and my question is about pivoting from the fossil fuel industry and into this great industry in geothermal. I have a couple of friends from the Philippines who've worked in the industry. Uh, a couple are drilling engineers, and they're very enthusiastic about you know, getting involved in the geothermal here in Canada. Um, however, <laughs> there are it's not that easy to, to, uh, to uh, pivot. Um, Catherine, you've pivoted from that fossil fuel into your current role. Um, I see myself, I'm in a supply chain. 
there is a tremendous fit in what I do. I do procurement and contracts management, and I see the the parallelism, parallelism between uh, geothermal and um, oil production, for example, is very risky. HSC is very important, environmental. So I see my, I guess my role uh, in order for me to transition in the industry is, as, I, as you suggested, Catherine, is to support getting rid of the bureaucracy uh, within the Alberta government to, to get this geothermal. So are there any thoughts that you can offer uh, for, for myself and for other people on this call who may be interested in, in transitioning 100% into geothermal? So I'm actually not the one, I haven't transitioned. And in fact, I was <laughs> totally shocked um, when I first started working in Alberta. So I guess my transition was to high temperature volcanic fields to low temperature sedimentary ones. And, uh, and my first shock was how small the well bores are. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like, really? Um, but we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about well design and whatnot in, a, in, another, um, in another section. So Alex, I, I, don't have a, I don't have an answer for you. Um, I think the answer is partly that we have to get, in, in some of the questions that we're getting is, how do we get more investment in geothermal and particularly mm. in Canada? If there were more projects, obviously there would be more people who are needed. But with only a handful of projects, most of those projects are being, oops, sorry, uh, most of those projects are, are being, um, you know, completed by, by some Canadian expertise, but also some, you know, other nationals. We just need more projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, that's where I'd like to leave it. We're on the hour now, and we promise to end in an hour. So please go to our website and uh, look at uh, what's coming up next. We will complete answering the questions. And I see there's two from Owen and, and Jonathan. Uh, I will complete answering those. And, uh, and then you, and I see another one from Dick. So we'll complete answering the questions and you'll get, your, get the answers in, uh, as part of a text format uh, in, as soon as it, it, uh, the thing gets um, uh, posted. So thank you so much. Um, looking forward to uh, seeing all of you next week. And um, yeah, that's all from us yep, today. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks bye bye. So much.